Well, are you in the middle of a wilderness season? I want you to discover what God can do when you surrender to His will as Jonathan and Rebecca Wise share their journey to love and a deeper faith. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. Proverbs 20, 24 says, A person's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand their own way? Well, you know, many times in life we face seasons of uncertainty, but God is always faithful. And with the help of our special guest today, you'll discover that when the Lord is writing your story, He truly does work all things for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to his purpose. But before we get to that, join me around the table is to have Ellen Ford. How are you? I am so blessed and I'm so happy to finally get to hear Rebecca's story. Yeah. Yes. Well, Rebecca's on the table. Yes. And we had the viewer feedback say, we want to hear some of the stories of the ladies yes. at the table. So we did your story. Yes. Kendra Kelly Dean, we just did yours. It'll be coming up. How did oh, yeah. that feel yesterday? Oh, that was so fun. There's yeah. something really, like you love meeting people individually. Yeah. But whenever you see their teammate with them, yeah. their spouse, it's yeah. a whole new thing. Yeah. And I love this couple very much. And there is a great purpose on their life. And for I'm sure. ready for all of them to get to hear their story. For sure, for sure. Rachel Ann Brown, you happen to be connected to the I happen to know a little bit about this couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And your family, Exciting. of course, is going to be good. We always love hearing everybody's story, don't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. And I just am so grateful that the Lord guides and directs us and brings us our perfect person. And That's right. Yes. Cindy Murdoch, hey. he does guide and direct us. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's like a tapestry. We just are woven together. And so it's beautiful to hear what we're going to hear today about this couple. For that we sure, love for so sure. Much. And this is my youngest daughter, Rebecca Weiss, and her. Her husband, Jonathan Hello. Weiss, welcome. Hey. Good to be here. <laughs> welcome to the table. She's going to be grabbing him the whole time. I can tell you that, but you know, I will. it's okay. This it's is right. awesome, guys. And then we don't know what she may say, so Jonathan, be ready. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's his job. That's one thing I've learned with Rebecca is you never know what she's going to say. I got right. that from my dad. Yes, she did. <laughs> you did get that from your dad. Well, often, you know, we must walk through the valley to get to the mountain, and it's in the valley that we find our moment of surrender. For Jonathan and Rebecca, the journey of faith has not been without its ups and downs, but it's a road that has strengthened their love of the Lord and brought them into each other's lives. And they're here to tell us more about that. Let's just start at the beginning, if we could. Um, Rebecca Lamb, you were born into an amazing family, I know. Amazing mother. <laughs> the best. <laughs> well, I was born and raised in a Christian home, and, you know, of course, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I really learned a lot watching you and dad. And I knew that I wanted to follow God's will for my life because I saw you guys be obedient to the Lord and follow him. Uh, but with every person that's raised in a Christian home, your faith has to be your own. That's right. yeah. And I had to learn, you have to have your own personal relationship with God. And so I remember being, I knew I was called into ministry from a really young age. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in summer camp when I was 17 and I just couldn't figure out Christianity, which sounds so odd because I was raised in such a strong spiritual background, Christian school, church my whole life, in ministry. But yet I struggled there. And I remember being sitting in the back of the camp and telling God, Lord, I want to follow you because I thought I had to do it on my own. I thought I thought I had to follow this list and if I messed up, it was all going to fall apart because I saw so many people in ministry fail and back then if you messed up, you were kicked out. And so I remember talking and asking God about it and he said, "Rebecca, abide in me and I'll abide in you." He was quoting John 15 to me. Well, I didn't know that and I thought that is a really strange phrase and so I just kind of let that be. <laughs> And I ended up going to college, Oral Roberts, and there was really a valley of decision for me. I ended up in this classroom because I loved to learn. I had this professor that was amazing. But his purpose in the class was actually to really get you to question your faith. And I ended up leaving that class agnostic. <laughs> 
And I just said, I'm not going to tell because I'm very passionate. I have a call to evangelism. So I thought I'm not going to tell people about hell if I don't even know if it's real. But mm -hmm. God's calling and gifts are in you regardless. And so I went around evangelizing on a Christian campus about agnosticism. So I had people tripping out that were students there because I would <laughs> oh, use those goodness. questions I learned in the class. And I go, well, how do you know this? And what about this in the Bible? What about this? But the one thing that's helped keep me by the grace of God was as I kept an open heart and I prayed mm -hmm. a prayer and I said, Lord, if you're real, show me yes. in a way that I can't deny. And so what was so funny is earlier in the semester, I had signed up for a mission trip two weeks to Ghana. I remember thinking, oh no, I don't even know if I believe in God. And here I am signed up for a mission oh. trip. And I remember talking to my leader and I said, is it okay for me to still go? And Thankfully, they said, yeah, you can still come. It's okay that you're struggling with your faith. We'll still allow you to come. So, so smart. here I am signed up for <laughs> missions training. And I remember going, okay, Lord, I'm going to have a good attitude about this. And I'm just going to have an open heart. But what ended up happening in that camp is they brought in a former student who was a missionary to Africa. And he started sharing these incredible testimonies of his work there, supernatural testimonies. And he told this story about the, one of the first times he went to Africa, how God, he had a, a supernatural encounter with a man who was Muslim. And he told him about Jesus. The guy said, follow me. He followed him. He led him to his uncle who was sitting on the ground. He had a towel covering his leg. And he says, do you believe Jesus can heal? And he said, I do believe Jesus can heal. And then the man lifted up the towel and the man had a massive tumor on his leg and he couldn't walk because of it. And he said, can your Jesus heal this? And the missionary said, yes, he can. And he said he had never prayed for anyone to receive healing in his life. And he timidly, he was, he was more soft-spoken. He, he said he just timidly hovered his hand over the man. And he said, Jesus, I ask that you heal this man's leg. And he said he saw like, like instantaneously the tumor fall off the leg, form back. Wow. And he was completely healed. And both wow. men fell on their faces crying. And they said, your God is the real God. And they got saved. But he shared testimony after testimony after testimony of the divine, supernatural love of God. Mm -hmm. When I heard him say that testimony, I prayed that same prayer as him. I said, mm -hmm. Lord, if this is what serving you is about, I want to serve you for the rest of my life. My life is yours. And the power of the Holy Spirit came on me. I felt him on my mouth and on my hands. And he spoke a word over me. He says, you'll speak my words with this mouth. You will do my works with your hands. And I had already said, like, God's real. I'm already on board. And then the speaker spoke up at the end and he said, you know, I almost didn't come tonight. I've had laryngitis for three weeks. I've been to three different doctors. I've gotten shots, antibiotics, and nothing has taken it away. He's like, he said, I'm asking for you guys to pray for me to be healed. And I remember God spoke to me and he said, um, he was like, you wanted to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm real. And I was like, well, God, I've already prayed the prayer. I'm already here. And he was <laughs> like, he's like, no, I'm going to show you that I'm real. And so we prayed for him and he got healed wow. that yeah. night. So he just sealed it wow. with that miracle. Yes. So, you know, it's been a journey ever since then. But that was really a defining moment in my yeah. life. Okay. Well, we got Rebecca saved. Thank God. <laughs> And I didn't know she was going around the campus. I'm just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I know. She's going to evangelize. I scared some, I scared some Whatever students. Whatever your passion is. Exactly. But they're yeah. all, I didn't sway anyone away. Okay. Everyone's solid from what I know with the yeah. Lord. Okay. So thank God. So let's go to you, Jonathan. We have another PK in the building. Another PK in the building. And I actually uh, figured out some parallels of our story while you were sharing yours that I didn't even realize before. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Rebecca, I grew up in a pastor's home. Um, my dad was on staff at the church that we were going to my whole life. And so I grew up in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, uh, crusade prayer early in the morning. And it was just a, very much a church baby. You know, you get your sleeping bag and you go to this 5 a.m. <laughs> prayer meetings. And oh, um, it wasn't until around the age of 13 or 14 that our church went through a split. And during that split, my faith got challenged for the first time. And I basically was thinking, well, if this doesn't work as a church, then how could God be real? You know, you're just starting to like come into your own as a man, 13, 14 years old. So that was when I began to doubt the Lord and then not, not pursue him or pursue a relationship with him. Um, and that went on for a couple of years. And then at the age of 16, I told my dad, so I served God for 16 years. So for the next 16 years, I'm not going to serve God. And my dad was like, Good luck, son. <laughs> and that was the beginning of me just on a complete hiatus from uh, the Lord and just basically pursuing everything that the world had to offer. Um, so fast forward to spring 2012, 
um, I'm going to university and um, I had actually, so this is where our story kind of parallels. I had um, applied for a college scholarship program with a ministry called Eagle's Wings that took students to Israel to show them the truth politically and historically about Israel. And so they would understand Israel from a biblical context and then they would go back and in return for their scholarship program, they would do something on campus to promote Israel and the truth about Israel. And your father's Israel. Jewish, so you were interested in that. Yeah, so I grew up, um, that's a good point to add to this story, is I grew up in a messianic home. So yeah, my parents were on staff at the church, but we also were doing uh, what started as a congregation in our home where we just do Shabbat dinners and then the appointed times like Passover and Hanukkah and um in our home, and that eventually grew into a congregation that would meet in the same church that my parents were on staff at. So um, my whole life, I just understood I was Jewish and I believed in Jesus. It was never weird for me. Um, and then coming to, fast forward to when I was 22 years old, and um, my mom actually is the one that sent me this application to apply for the scholarship program. And so I'm filling out this application because I was like, I want to go to Israel. Um, and on the application, it says, like, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? And I didn't at the time. And so I was like, hmm, but I want to go on this program. And I was like, and I did believe at one point. <laughs> so here I am lying on this application. <laughs> uh, I love it. Yeah. And uh, I was like, there's no way I'm going to get in because, you know, there's hundreds or thousands of applicants probably because it's a full expenses paid trip. So I put all my experience and all of this stuff, and I ended up getting selected. But leading up to the time of the trip, I actually have a complete surrender of my life to the Lord, which is kind of wild. I was in my room. It was a late night, and um, I was completely sober, and I was actually in a moment of desperation um, where I had been pursuing all of these things in college that were going so well, but I felt like this really tangible emptiness in my heart, and I didn't know what that was. Rebecca, as my wife knows, I'm not super emotive. So I was like, this is so much, so many feelings. <laughs> um, and I remember crying out to the Lord and knowing that I was crying out to God, to Jesus. And I instantaneously felt his sovereign presence enter the room. I never saw a being or um, a person, but I felt God's presence like I've never felt before or since. And what began to happen was, Marcus well, hey, and I had been praying for you for years, just so you know. That probably helped <laughs> between for, you two for who and my mom. Mary Rebecca, <laughs> yeah. 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 So from like the top of my head all the way to the cells of my feet, I felt this love, which you can't even really describe it. Cause I don't know, how do you describe that? But um, I just began to feel healing and restoration to my heart and to who I was. And then immediately coming out of this experience, knowing right away that I wanted to surrender my life to the Lord. I, everyone has different experiences with yeah. the Lord, but this was something that I was like, wow, that's amazing. I think, is this going to happen every weekend? You know, like, <laughs> is the Lord going to visit me in my room like this all the time? Um, but I knew that I wanted to surrender my life to the Lord because once you experience something like that, there's really no going back. Um, so at the time, I had friends that I grew up going to Jesus Culture and Bethel Church in Redding, this is Northern California. I had friends that were going to their school of ministry there that I grew up with back in the church split. Um, so I called them. I said, hey, guys, I want to come visit y'all. You always go and, and call those people you know that love Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they were shocked. They're like, what is he going to do? Because they knew that I wasn't walking with the Lord. They were like, I wonder why he's coming up here. So I went up to visit them and went to church. And that, that Sunday morning, you know, it wasn't an altar call or anything. It was just during the worship that I just invited Jesus into my heart and committed my life to him. And um from that day on, it's been the most amazing adventure. So y'all kind of have those parallels where there's God moments. It's actually the, we're, we're different ages. He's older, but 2012, the spring was the exact same time as me. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And well, the other parallel that I didn't realize is that we both went on trips, trips. from yeah. the Lord that we weren't qualified to go on. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> but they were life-changing life for They were life-changing because I ended up they? going to Israel. Yeah, I wanted you to tell that part because it's important. This is like very early in me coming back to the Lord. So I'm reading the Bible for the first time. With new as eyes. As an adult, right? With, through the lens of being a Jewish believer that's in Israel, reading all these prophecies and the, like, you know, getting, you wow. guys have all been to Israel. So going to the tour sites and hearing about what took place in the land and God's promises and the covenant that has been um, 
brought with the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And so I got my whole world completely turned upside down um, and knew in that week's time, the calling that I had and ver like the Lord spoke verses over my life there that still to this day, um, I champion in my what heart. What was one of those verses? Can you share? Yeah, it was on the city of David. God spoke Isaiah 62, 6 and 7 to me, which is, I place watchmen on the walls, O Jerusalem, that you give me no rest day or night until I make Jerusalem appraised in all the earth. But you know how it is. The Lord will give you these verses and you're like, oh, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and then, you know, he just releases it to you layer, layer, yeah. layer over time. Yeah, because you I actually um, moved to Israel and lived there for a time and then came back not really knowing that when... Well, he does marry Rebecca. I'll just tell you that little <laughs> secret. That when he marries Rebecca, that he would be here and be connected mm -hmm. to Israel in a bigger way right. than if he had actually even been there in, yeah. per in person, which was all part of God's plan. Okay, so let's get to how you two got together. It's such a fun story because it involves <laughs> this place and all yes. these people. <laughs> it does. Okay, so this is super fun. So I finished Bible school. Well, this is actually really important to the story. So I was going to King's University through Gateway Church. In my senior year, I ended up taking on a ton of extra classes because I was trying to graduate by a certain time. And what's so interesting is I was so busy. I was so focused on school. I had no time for anything else. Well, while I'm going to school, going to summer school, about to finish, he comes and tours the exact same school. So he fills a call to Texas. When I'm returning from Israel, I'm asking God what's next. This is after I lived in Israel, not that scholarship program. And God tells me, um, I have a place, I've carved out a place for you in Texas. And so I said, okay. You carve it out. So I, I get home and I apply to a bunch of jobs and I fly to Texas <laughs> and I spend two weeks staying on a friend's couch and going to all of these. Like, he tours my school and I never see him. We're like ships in the night yeah. passing because we were there at the same say, time. There, nothing like is fruitful out of that trip. I didn't like any of the companies. I didn't, I didn't want to go to King's. And while I'm there, I interview with a tech company back in the Bay Area that mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. was exactly what I was looking for. And so I go back. Thinking, what was that all for? Yeah, and the thing about God is that he'll show us these things, but yeah. the timing, yep. we yep. learn in the process that sometimes but, that, um, yes, we kind of know what direction God's taken us, but we've got to be sensitive to that timing. So uh, you go to Silicon Valley, and then... I graduate. You graduate. I end up here, and yeah. I'm ready to start in here full time. Yeah. I start doing the show. Rachel remembers these are the OG yeah. days. So this was Marcus and Joni. Just walk on. Yeah. Y'all had that wooden table. Yeah. And, you know, the aquarium old set, and me and Rachel <laughs> would just kind of... With fish behind <laughs> us, yeah. We were like little place bookends, you yeah. know, on my side, mom and dad. And, you know, we we I walked down and, you know, I would we would do our like two minutes of talking yeah. and then I went right back up. His parents were guests on that show. I didn't even see his parents. They didn't talk to his parents. You were just at the top of the I show. I was at the top of the show, went upstairs, unspinnounced to me, went back to doing whatever I was doing in production. And basically... Uh, his mom gets in a conversation with Susie and they start talking and she finds out that Catherine has a son, but Catherine knew not to say anything to him because KK had been trying to set Jonathan up with different girls and Jonathan would always be like, right. no, no, no. He had to, he KK had, is what the grandkids call her. Yeah. yeah. So that's Catherine. He, he yeah. had to hunt and find his own woman on his own. Right. So basically, <laughs> they, being the smart parents that they are, they send him the link to the episode and say, hey, watch this episode and critique our interview and give us feedback. Right. And he doesn't look at it. So take over. How long yeah, did it so take I, you? Uh, there was a couple a couple reminders from my mom. And you didn't look at it. No. And then <laughs> I had a lot going on. The Lord had a gift waiting for you. I know. <laughs> but it was, it's cool because eventually the Holy Spirit hit me with it. And so then I was like, oh, okay. So I throwed down the laptop and I remember exactly where I was. And you I, threw it down? Like I threw it down. <laughs> he was in the Jews for Jesus house in San Francisco. I was. Okay. And watched that episode. And I was like, wow, Rebecca, she's pretty and she looks fun. I added her on Facebook and I think I said something like, hey, my parents were on your show. Nice to meet you or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 
He was, um, what's so funny. I was in the room when she saw <laughs> that he had added her. He, yep. She had her computer on the couch. And oh, I, I, had, know that. I yeah. had a heads it's up. It's just like, oh, this must be the guy that da da da, you know? Oh my God. And I had a heads up, like, hey, this guy he might try to friend might you. Might try to friend you, because I had a bunch of random people friending me. We didn't, I don't think we had any mutual friends or anything. And so I accepted him. We started talking. And then I got awkward and left him on. I hadn't read the message, but he basically sent a message saying, hey, like we had had small talk. And then he was like, hey, if you ever come out to the city, love to host you sometime. Well, that was the message. Girl, he wanted to host you. And I did not read it. And I just <laughs> left him on pause. Yeah, well, no, 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 wait, this is, I know this, I know this story, <laughs> folks. And so he said that and she wanted to go, but she didn't want to just send back a quick message. She wanted to craft a message. Sure. You know, that was part of it. I got intimidated. I yeah. do this thing where I get intimidated and I just don't read it. You know, you put it on pause and then way too much time passes. I ended up going to Nigeria with dad. Oh. And when I got back from Nigeria, which was an amazing trip, I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know what? I, I like worked up the courage. I'm going to respond to this guy. And well, wait, I, before you respond. So at this point, I had told my mom that I had reached out to the daughter of the people of the show they were on and <laughs> we were talking and I liked her. And I was like, I even invited her to San Francisco. And my mom was like, what? These are godly people. You can't invite them to San Francisco. So I was like, oh, I guess I ruined that. Yeah, so he thought he, oh, he, so thought he shoot his shot too early or too soon. And so I realized when I open up Facebook Messenger, it's been like almost a month. And I'm thinking, this guy is never going to talk to me ever again. I've ruined it. I've ruined, you know, and so at the time I shared an office with Kayla. Well, Kayla's one of our writers. So I she invoked help the help of Kayla. I said, use your writing skills to help me craft the most <laughs> sorrowful response I can get so I can get this guy to talk to me again. So I sent like, par like I mean, super long response. I was going to pull it up. <laughs> oh, please don't. It's probably so embarrassing. No, it was good. And you, you read it to me. No, it was good. Yeah. He took three days mm -hmm. to respond back because he wanted me to feel it what just did you a think little bit. When you read that wait, 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 well, well, she said, you know, she said, say sorry, I've been out of the country. No, da, no. Da, da, you it was know, legit. And, and so when you read it, were you like, okay, finally, a yeah, response? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was like, okay, finally. And I was like, but I am not replying I'm right away. I'm still in the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I was like... I'll just let her sweat it for a few days and then I'll reply. <laughs> I deserved it. No, I, I know. Okay, so, so then what did you say when you wrote back? Probably just went straight into planning how we were going to make it happen. He was essentially, smart. We he took it off of Messenger because I was like, oh, I yes. don't like being on Messenger. So he sends me his number. So what do I do? I immediately uh, save funny. it in my phone under his name. She's so excited. So he gives me a call one day, <laughs> smart man, while he's going to the DMV. So he has an out. We only can talk for like 10 minutes. It was during Heart for the World. I was out going to buy pots or balloons or something random for production. <laughs> so he calls and what do I do? She answers the phone very friendly and true Rebecca nature. She's like, hey. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, you have my number saved already. Yeah, so I was caught. <laughs> <laughs> and so we immediately hit it off, and he, he was a safe, you know, he had the she little window. There, there's a tree in the backyard with a swing, and how many times did I look out the window, and she oh. would be out there literally for hours. sometimes hours talking to him on the phone. Yeah. What were we talking So about? our first conversation was that short DMV one. The next time it was... Our Tough. second conversation, and we talked until my phone died. It was in that tree, under that tree in our backyard. I was on that swing, and we realized that a lot of our passions, um, we talked about worship. We talked about countries we felt like God had called us to, and they just, there was so much alignment. And, and I remember getting off the end of the conversation was so effortless. And mm -hmm. I remember getting off the phone thinking, oh my goodness, there might actually be something here with this guy. And we That's ended up talking. dating long distance and all we could do was talk. And it's one of the best ways to date mm -hmm. someone because there's is. no physical involved. You have to only get to know the person. And right. it, I mean, you're, so you're not going to have chemistry with someone talking to them, you know, if that's, all you have basically yeah. so we really got to truly know one another and then after three months i realized i got to go out there and meet this guy we got to get around each other in person and see if there's something here more to just conversation with his mom and dad and so i brought my best friend morgan um of the time and we went out there together i was so nervous i remember being in the plane on the way to san francisco every time the plane kind of felt like it was descending my heart went up into my throat <laughs> i was so nervous to meet him 
And we hung out on that trip. And I mean, I was super into Jonathan. And I didn't know I was doing this at the time. Like, way in. But what I did not know was Jonathan, a lot of girls liked him before we got together. A lot of dads wanted him because he's such a great guy to marry their daughter. And he was, you know, in the ministry world. So a lot of people were trying to make it happen. And a lot of times what would end the relationship or in the prospect of him dating someone is when they would do the DTR. It's called determine the relationship conversation, which is what are Define. we? Define the relationship. And so me not knowing that this had ended so many things that he had in the past, we're about to end this trip. And I'm like, you know, I'm about to go away to New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and I want to know- I think I invited you on that trip. Yeah. He did. And I'm come. so mad he didn't come. I wish I had. He I wishes know. he had. I mean, oh. I was like, just come on with us. And so I asked him, I said, what, what are we? Are we going to be together? Are we not? And I didn't know that this was, so you tell your end. No, I was like, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember you also threatened me with other men. You were like, you I never. I did not threaten you with like, other men. <laughs> That's so annoying. She was they're like, they're lightning you. They're lightning me. OK, thank yeah. you, Kendra. She was like, you never know who I might meet across the world. And I was like, golly. <laughs> And there was a guy, I think, that had DM'd me or something on Instagram, and I was like, what are we? You know, like, I'm like, because if we're exclusive, then, you know, there will be no... I mean, I wanted to know the better no, that we were in. No, I think so he was we're, almost, we're out of time, but so... Sorry. What, what did you say? I said, um, let's both take one night and pray and talk to both of our parents, and if they both give us their blessing to be in a committed relationship, then tomorrow at breakfast we will define the relationship. And that's what happened. And I called you and I. Yeah. He called Miles and Catherine. And of course, the <laughs> end of the story is they they got married, had a beautiful wedding. Have two babies. Have two little boys that are beautiful. And God has been so amazing. that We'll have to continue to tell the rest of the story of all the things that have gone on. But we love, love you both. Love you. And thank you for sharing your story, especially the vulnerable parts early on, because I feel like there are some parents watching right now and you just been sitting there listening to this whole story like the rest of us. And but the part that really got you is when they were talking about how they had to find yes. their way to the Father and how God was so faithful in mm -hmm. all of that. I feel like the Lord's saying, I'm gonna be faithful to your kids. I'm gonna reveal myself. You keep praying, keep standing. Is there something that the Lord is challenging you with? I mean, is there an area of your life that you need to surrender? To me, that's kind of what stands out in the story is the fact that Jonathan said yes and Rebecca said yes. And really, when you say yes to sur surrender, you really don't know what all the Lord is going to do with you. But the beautiful thing about it is that God has something specifically designed for you and your life when you connect to the one who created you. Maybe you're watching today and you don't know the Lord. I want to encourage you to just pray that prayer, invite Jesus in. And it's really very simple. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All we have to do is say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come into my heart right now, and he will be Lord of your life. Well, I wouldn't be here at this table without surrender myself, and neither would anyone else. So let go of control, of expectations. Let God show you his powerful plan and purpose for your life. If you're watching today, you have something you need to surrender. That's why that toll-free number is on the screen. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you prayed that prayer to the Lord, call us and let us know. I want to send you a free book entitled, Now What? I do want to thank my daughter, Rebecca, and my son in love Jonathan, for joining us at the table. I hope you were touched, inspired by their story. They're really cute, I have to say. If you, if you were inspired, please let us know. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. We love hearing about what God is doing in your life. Thank you so much for watching. Be encouraged today. Hey, and don't give up on those kids. God is working. They're coming home in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.